Bank of Canada is not going to increase their interest rate just because there's a war going on in Russia and Ukraine. Stay tuned to find out exactly what I mean. Promise you, it'll be worth it. Good day, Toronto. Welcome to another episode of Prime Property. So glad you're joining me here today. Look, there's a lot of things happening in the world right now, and I'm not going to touch too much onto kind of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. But a lot of people have been asking me and wondering, how is that going to impact the Toronto real estate market? Look, I'm going to give you my short answer is nobody will know. But I do have an interesting article that I'm going to share with you right here where from Financial Post saying that the Ukraine war is not going to affect the decision point from Bank of Canada regarding tomorrow's interest rate hike. And I completely agree with this, okay? Because everyone always, is always trying to find a relation, a correlation, a causation, something that's going to make A become B. And there's always bias and attached to it. But while there's a lot of things going on you know, in the eastern side of the world, I don't think the Bank of Canada is going to look at it and be like, oh, hey, I'm not going to increase the interest rate. Now, is this going to be something that you know, plays out longer in the future where it can be an excuse for them to not increase the interest rate? Absolutely. I 100% think there's something of that nature that could be coming down the pipeline. But the amount of political forces that's being pushed down on the Bank of Canada to increase interest rate hikes uh, tomorrow is actually quite high. So I would say like 80 to 90 percent chance they're probably going to increase the interest rate. And again, and just in case you haven't really seen any of my previous kind of like thought processes is we're probably going to see like three interest rates, two to three, no more than that. And we have to get one in March. Otherwise, things are going to get really, really bad because there's going to be a loss of confidence in kind of how we're fighting inflation. And I think those who are in power right now are more concerned about that than what's happening in the East, because that's not affecting them as directly as how they're perceived by the people that are looking at the interest rates needing to be increased. So that's kind of how I see it. So in this article over here, we got talking about how this kind of thought process I am agreeing with. But you have to remember, this is a really interesting thing I highlighted. It says, those people who have decided that the Bank of Canada Governor Tip Nakalem is afraid of the CPI more than the Russia President Putin, I agree. And this is what I was saying earlier. They need to focus on the inflation that everyone locally is more concerned about. Yes, I agree. There's a lot of crazy things that's happening in the east side. But I'm, sta again, staying in my lane and they're also going to be more focused on what's happening locally than what's happening across the board because there's only so many things that they could realistically do. Like, you know, Bank of Canada can't increase or decrease interest rates to, you know, affect the war. It just doesn't happen that way, right? As much as we want it to be. Yeah, so like obviously a lot of things are happening in the world right now. And is it going to trickle down to kind of like whether you should decide to buy or sell real estate? I think the short answer is just no, right? Because even if we do have an interest rate hike increase called 0.25%, it's not going to be nominal enough to change the market, right? And I have been saying recently, like we've noticed a slowdown and maybe some people are thinking that this could be the catalyst that causes the market to slow down. Possibly, there is possibly a chance. Or could it be that everyone's also just kind of waiting to see what happens because, you know, tomorrow the interest rate hike, you know, ties it into the whole Russia thing. Yeah, obviously as well. So that we have to wait and see. And when the market is slowing down, like I was saying in the last video, right? We're going from a 12 out of 10, meaning like just everyone's just throwing money, like the Futurama here, take my money kind of meme for all housing to a lot of sellers are now kind of um, getting their house ready to sell. And if they can get it, the price that they want, they will sell. If not, they're going to take it off the market. And I'm seeing a lot of that. So there's a lot of listings being terminated. There's no desperate seller that's going to cause a market to crash. So if you're kind of on the fence of buying or selling, you could always wait it out. The market is going from a 12 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. It is still very much a seller's market. But instead of, like again, 20 offers, we're seeing maybe like five on a good property and maybe no offers on a property that doesn't really show that well. And that's kind of the lull we saw last year at the end of March where we didn't really get much of a spring market. It just got pulled for it. And it's, I think it's looking the same thing right now. And if we get an interest rate hike increase, and I've said this before many times, but I'll repeat it here. We're probably going to see a surge of first-time home buyers who are holding a pre-approval jump into the market and try to buy something before you know their rate kind of like hold this um, disappears. But after that, we'll probably stagnate. And I'm going to get more about another article that talks about this. So that's kind of where I see right now. Like, are we like cresting at the peak of pricing? Yeah, probably. I would say so. So if you are kind of like waiting around to make a decision on the real estate market, you can just continue waiting. It's not going to change anything. Right now, uh, one of these things that I is going to address kind of what's happening in the world right now is the price of gas, if you guys haven't noticed, is really, really getting high. Right. I'm not going to get into the whole macro or geopolitical stuff, but essentially Russia produces a lot of oil 
right? And oil, we don't tap into our reserves as, as Canadians. So we're paying an increased price in gas. So while that intrinsically has a weight of affecting the market, most people don't understand it. So as like the Bank of Canada, like Tiff Macklin was probably looking at, it's like the war itself may have an effect on inflation, especially like gas, but they're more focused on how they're perceived because of the inflation. So that's why I don't think, again, Ukraine and what's happening is going to affect the decision tomorrow on what's going to happen. Again, back to 89% will probably see a rate hike increase. I'm not surprised, but how it's going to trickle down the market is probably some people try to rush in to buy something and then we'll probably stagnate, right? So I got the next article here, which is talking about what's next for the Canada housing market in this age of uncertainty. Now, this may sound like a really bad headline, and I agree it's a really bad headline, but I need to draw your attention to this because this was written by Stephen Polos, who was the old head of Bank of Canada, right? I think he was around when Harper was in control. So I've highlighted a couple points here, and I actually think it's really, really kind of thought provoking to kind of see how he's perceiving this, right? So the first thing I got here is that he's saying that way too many economists are engaged in the housing bubble debate for several years, and no one really knows what's going on. And that's it. No one really knows what's going on. Whether I say it or that guy says it or this economist says it, nobody knows. But if we've been constantly talking about prices going up and it being a bubble, at what point is it self-fulfilling and we do be, be a bubble? Because it's gotta come down at some point. But everyone who thinks that it's going to come down because it's unaffordable is not really kind of grasping what's happening in the kind of macro side of why prices are going up. They just want the prices to come down or they want a reason for it to come down and they'll always be looking for it, right? It's kind of like a bias that they have, but when you actually look at what's happening and they'll go into some more, it's very hard to see this coming down. Now you can see here, he, his first two points that he's suggesting why prices are going up is one, population growth, right? So he's saying that we fail to build enough homes for the amount of immigration coming in. And the crazy thing that I have highlighted down here is when he was in power, the um, Canadian government was bringing in about 200,000 people, give or take, a year. Now we've doubled that since the Liberals have been in power, and we've increased it by another like 7 or 8% since the last announcement. So now we're targeting like 430 to 450,000 immigrants coming into Canada in the next three years. That's absolutely crazy. That's a lot. Now, he does talk, talk about how as people kind of sprawl out, which is what we saw during the pandemic, um, those prices get more and more expensive, which is what you just kind of see over here. But as the distance to the suburbs get further and further, people start flocking into this core more and more. And this is why I made a video or a whole series of videos talking about why Toronto condo prices are under market. As the flock to these um, exurbs, I'm calling it exurbs, I'm not even talking about your Vaughn, Markham's, or Richmond, I'm talking about your, your Peterboroughs, your Berries, your Aurelia, your St. Catharines. Like people have sprawled all the way over there to get into the core to work. That's a really long drive, really, really long drive. Now, I get maybe if you can work remote, that makes sense, but there's gonna be kind of a return back into the city center. And he talks about that right now. As more and more people pile in, you can only sprawl so much in the burbs because of low rise housing. So that's why you're also seeing a lot of 905 areas get condos right now because it's just affordable and that's where people are buying. I don't think it's a good investment, just a video for a different day, but if you're going to get into something that's in the affordable range, like call it sub $700,000, $800,000, you're better off getting it in the downtown core as soon as possible, right? Now, he says the second uh, price driver is low interest rates. And we've talked about this many, many times, right? When you have cheap money and you have no yields, right? Everyone flocks towards something that has yields, which is in real estate. And it's kind of risky because when they buy real estate, it's speculating on prices going up, right? Because at no point anymore are you going to get a good yield strictly off of cash flow. It just doesn't work. So that's kind of why when you have interest rates, right? Like the cost of borrowing is lower than the real inflation rate, meaning the after inflation, you're always gonna see people flock into hard assets. And he's saying this right here too, which I totally agree. Now you can see here in this chart, kind of the interest rate since 2016. We're hovering around the 0.5. This is like the Bank of Canada overnight interest rate, which affects the variable. And they've tried to climb it up to about 1.75. And then they've dropped it back down uh, during the pandemic. So I think we're gonna to need to see like at least 2% overnight rate and the mortgage rate at like 3% before we see some kind of stagnation or prices having pressure to go downwards, right? And he's saying here exactly this, that there's these two forces are constantly clashing with one another. And what's gonna be a stronger force? I think the population that's coming into Canada is gonna be a bigger driving force than the interest rate because of one thing right now. It's that the Bank of Canada doesn't want to increase interest rate. I think if it were left up to them, 
they would keep it low for as long as possible because they've kicked the can down the line, like down the road, yeah, down the road for so long that there's just no way for them to fix this other than make the money inflated away. And for them to do that, they need to go into um, an economy where it's called financial repression, where the interest rates to cost of borrow is lower than that of the real interest rate, meaning the inflation is running high. So they're going to have to keep doing this to make all that debt look smaller in the future. And so that's why they're going to find any excuse to not increase interest rate unless there is a lot of pressure to do it. Right. So right now they're just talking about increasing interest rates and they need to show that they are first. So when they do it tomorrow, it'll be like, bam, we told you so. But when the next few are coming, I don't know. Right. Because they're going to find an excuse. That's what I think. Right. That's why I'm always saying two to three interest rate this year. If we're not seeing six, seven right? people are just spooking you out. Right. And here he talks kind of about the biggest risk about the housing market if the prices do come down. It's that those who need to sell in order to buy or those whose mortgages are higher than the value of their home, that's when we're going to be in a big trouble. That's what happened in the um, great financial crisis or the subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S., right? There's another very interesting point that I want to draw your attention to that he creates is that saying that we become at risk in the housing market, like coming a crash and all escalating downwards and um, you know, everybody just piling in when our mortgages are higher than the value of our home. So like say if you have a mortgage of a million bucks, but your home is only worth $900,000. That's what happened in 08 in US and the subprime mortgage crisis. And that will obviously cause a huge cascading effect on the market. I don't think we're going to get there, but he does say this, and this is really important, right? And I highlight this in green. He says, while that can happen, those who take the long view, right? So this is why I always tell my clients, investors, buy and hold, buy and hold. Unless you're losing your job and your personal home, you, it's not going to affect you whether your house is worth $1, $10, or $10 million, right? So you take the long view in terms of homes. Historically, price declines do reverse over time. So that's what I say. Cash flow is great, so you can ride out the bad times. If you own the home, you're living it, you're paying for it anyways. As long as you have a job that's paying for it, you should be good, right? Now, the thing that I've always kind of talked about is job pressure. And he talks about this as well, too. This is why I'm really like adding a lot of um, kind of color onto his article, where if you can't um, pay for your mortgage because you lost a job, then that's when you're in big doo-doo, right? And we're going slowly getting pressure on that because if a lot of employers are going to be outsourcing their jobs because people can work from home, what happens to your job, your high paying job because you're in Canada? Does it get outsourced? And that's something I have to watch out for. But those companies who value kind of like a good culture, everyone works locally. At some point, they're going to probably f find more incentives for you to stay at your company. And he's saying that maybe they can see some kind of like companies guaranteeing your mortgage as well, like later down this kind of article. So it's a very fascinating way to kind of approach how like life will be in the future with kind of the economy, because we're in a really, really crazy time right now. And the one last thing I will add about this article is he talks about how there's an aging demographic and a transition to zero emissions, which is kind of the whole climate change thing. And because that's going to be tucked into uh, central bankers, that's why another reason I'm saying I don't think interest rates are ultimately going to increase very high. Um, but the thing about the aging demographics is a lot of the workers are baby boomers and they're all retiring. So that is left with a lot of the millennials, you know, people between like late 20s to 40s right now. That's going to take over the workforce. But there's a lot more people retiring than there's people working. So this is like a whole demographic thing. And if you want to check out a video that talks about the big macro framework of this, there's a really good video I can link to in the description um, where Raul Paul from Real Vision talks about the macro framework of the demographic shifting. And that's actually a very interesting uh, kind of conversation he has if you're really interested into kind of like where the long term horizon is going to be with this like crazy debt cycle. So that's kind of like the framework of everything I've been wrapping my head around in terms of what's happening in the real estate market. Like again, short term, I'll still, I'm still very bullish. I think we're going to stagnate, but long term, I think we're into like some crazy things that's going to happen in interest rate and asset prices are going to go up. And he kind of fully talks about all of this right here. So you really want to have a good read at it. I'll put a link in the description of this article as usual. If this is the type of real estate content you enjoy, make sure you help us spread knowledge by smashing that like button and subscribing to the Prime Props channel because every week we make awesome content like this two times a week minimum now, right? And maybe even sometimes three so that we can be transparent and honest with you to show you that, you know what, like whenever you are ready to buy, sell, invest, you'd be like, you know what, I'm going to talk to Zen because he knows what's going on in the market right now. And when you want to do that, you can book a call with me using the link right here. It's www.chavzen.com. It's very easy. Now, the next article we have here says Canada's housing market could crash, soar, or there's an option that nobody's talking about. And I was talking about this. It's about, you know, staying flat, right? So they're saying how here that um, John Pasalis of Realosophy is saying how, you know, it makes sense if you're borrowing at 1.5% interest rate and that asset you're borrowing to buy goes up 20% a year. It makes 
total sense to for everyone to throw money at real estate. And that's kind of what we saw in the last two years. But as interest rates goes up and we see that kind of scare by central bankers saying, hey, we're going to continue to raise rate. Yeah, I think the demand on the investor side, and I'm going to say more speculators than investors, is probably going to slow down. And when we build more homes, that should cause the market to kind of stagnate. Because at some point, like, it doesn't really make sense for prices to go up at 20% a year. Let's be real. It's not, right? Like, uh, Canada, specifically GTA, has gone up about 6% a year. And for us to do 20% a year is just crazy. It makes no sense, no matter how much money we print. Like, at some point, the world's going to blow up from kind of like some kind of revolution because housing becomes unaffordable. And we don't want Canada to become that, right? So you can see this kind of point I highlighted. It's kind of like what the Stephen Polos guy, <laughs> Stephen Polos guy was talking about where like you have low interest rates clashing with high immigration. And this part right here says that we need to build an additional 1.8 million homes just to reach the average amount of homes that we need to house everybody, right? So that's kind of where the demand and supply side is kind of working with, right? Like people need home, interest rates are too low. People are buying homes because interest rates are low, but we have keep bringing more people to come into kind of Canada. And that's kind of where this dynamic keeps shifting up and down. And like in the long term, I think we're probably going to see prices go up over time as opposed to go down just because you can't fight population growth caused by the federal government, especially the liberals with like interest rate hikes where you have so much pressure to keep interest rate low. And that's kind of the underlying the kind of message that you should understand from this video. So if you understand that, that's why you have a long-term horizon in terms of where real estate prices are going to be. It's probably buy and hold and you'll be fine, right? There's a couple of cool charts. I think I've had that down here to show you how badly the kind of housing stock is in Canada compared to the rest of the G7 nations. So you can see here, if you don't include Canada, we have way too little homes for every thousand people. We have 450, which is really low compared to the rest of the uh, world, which is why we always say we have a supply problem. And when you mix that in with low interest rate and you have an excess demand, that's why prices skyrocket in the last two years. And when you take kind of Canada average compared to the rest of the G7 nation, you can see we're really, really low. Now, when you spread this out through all our provinces, you can see Ontario is the worst of them all. So do we have a gold mine being investors in the golden horseshoe? I think so, right? And that's why I've always been saying, take the long-term approach, buy and hold because interest rates will stay low and immigration keeps coming in and a lot of people keep coming here. And we're just going to have to kind of work with that. And as investors, we have to get creative. Cash flow may not make sense anymore somewhere down the line and it has to be a lot more about appreciation or just make breaking even and hold the asset, right? So these are things that are constantly changing that I'll keep you guys updated on. Now, the final two things I'm going to talk about that I've highlighted in this article here is that everyone thinks it's only happening locally, but you guys aren't paying attention to what's happening around the world. And it's happening, this whole like uh, asset price running up is happening all around the world. I just think it's extra bad in Canada because we've always had a supply crisis. So the pandemic has caused a whole surge of people investing in real estate because of low interest rates. But because we had a supply problem already with low supply, that's probably what caused our increase to be that much more than the rest of the world. And the last thing you say is, think the third thing that could happen is when you have unaffordable prices, at a long period of time, the what happens is this could be stagnation and where prices don't move instead of a crash because everyone thinks that it has to go up or down. There's a very likelihood it just stays flat line. And if anything, that's actually the best for everybody because there's no swings of volatility and you know everything is just less stressful is what I would call it. All right, I'm running a little bit long on this video, but I got two more articles for you. And the last one is actually very interesting talking about which uh, areas have seen the greatest price increase. So in regards to this article here, it says five signs Canada's housing market is completely bonkers. I'm just going to go through each and every single one of them. The first one is talking about how we've had so many million dollar cities. When your average price point in Canada is $700,000, that means there's a lot of cities with a price point of over a million dollars. And when you compare it to kind of some of the U.S. cities, uh, we're way too expensive. Like I think um, like the Hamiltons of the world is more expensive than some of the major cities. We have to remember the major problem in Canada is there's only f real four cities maybe that people live in and all of those four cities are really expensive. So does it make sense for some people to move to the U.S.? Absolutely. But are there people who have roots being in Canada or some people want to be in Canada over the U.S.? Absolutely as well, right? So it's like an apples and oranges comparison. You can't really say that. Uh, the second one is prices are up almost half in just two years, like up 50%. That is absolutely crazy. It's not sustainable. I think the U.S. is up about 26% in two years, so like half of what we have. So that is absolutely insane. The next one I think that's important is income growth has been left in the dust. And I've been saying this for a very, very long time. The rate at which 
incomes are increasing is by nowhere even close to the rate of what real estate prices are increasing by. And they don't have to match. It's just we're so accustomed to everyone being able to buy a home and own a home. But if you go into like older cities in Europe or even China, the thought of owning a home just doesn't exist anymore. So I think that's going to be completely wiped up. And I've highlighted this point where I even said there's zero linkage between growth prices and the ability for the popu Canadian population to afford them. That's just something we're going to have to get used to. So not saying buy the market right now while you still can, but yeah, there's actually some merit to that. Um, then we got here the inflation and the interest rate outlooks are worsening. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And the last point here is nobody wants to sell. When you have nowhere else to put your money, and I've been telling all my clients this too, I'm like, if you don't have to sell, don't sell because you're holding onto an asset, even though it's a really big mortgage, the mortgage, you're basically shorting the Canadian dollar because it's going to be worth less in the future and you're paying it back with future money that's worth less. That's what a mortgage is right now. It actually is an asset, despite how crazy you think that sounds. But if you really think about what I'm talking about, the mortgage will be an asset for you in five, 10 years, okay? Five to 10 years, not five, 10 years. And we got the last article here where Remax came out with which market in the kind of region of GTA has outperformed the best in the last 25 years. But the big headline here I'll show you is the average price in the GTA has increased by 450% in the last 25 years since 1996. Think about that. We started at $198,000 on average and now we're at $1.1 million, $1 million. It's almost 5x or we've doubled in five years every single year, which is crazy, right? Now, I'll, send, I'll put a link again in the description below for read this, but I just want to kind of show you <laughs> this chart here of what properties have done the best. And you can kind of look here, you can see that York region in the last 25 years has done the best. And this is crazy if you think about it because York region got hit the hardest in 2017, but there was a huge surge to move into the burbs into like your um, Vaughn's, Richmond Hills and Markham's back in the early 2010s. And then there was a dip from the uh, foreign buyer tax and then it has gone back up in the last two years. And when you look at all of this, it may freak you out to see that Toronto Central has um, increased the least amount as a percentage, but you have to remember, it's a flock to affordability, meaning that um, Toronto is always going to be the most expensive area to buy in. So uh, a 4% increase in Toronto on a million dollar home is still higher than a 5% increase in the burbs when it's a $700,000 home, right? Because the nominal amount is actually higher because Toronto starts off more expensive. So don't be like, oh, Toronto's actually the worst place to invest in. If you actually look at it, it's the spread between the sprawl and the burbs, like I was saying in the uh, beginning of the video, has gone so far out that there actually is value in Toronto and it's undervalued right now. So if you're kind of looking for where value is, it's Toronto actually. So it's something to keep in mind. Hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of what I'm experiencing and seeing on the market right now. And anyone who tells you that they have one way to look at straightly of what's happening in the market, you really got to question what they're saying because things are changing so fast that if you're not taking into all these inputs and changes that are coming in to change kind of your philosophy and the theory of where you think the market's going to be, you really should kind of reconsider why they have that kind of bias, right? So like, even for me, like it's the ability to look at information and think critically about what's happening and you need to be able to do that as well. So if you're looking for kind of help to kind of navigate what the hell is happening, because like things are really changing on like a week to week, week basis, whether the market, macroeconomics or all the things that's happening in the world right now, you can book a call with me using the link on the screen. It's www.chavzen.com. Until next time, your move, your future. See ya. Now that you're done watching this one, how about this one? Oh, you know what? This one's good too. Ooh. This one's really good. You know what? Just watch the most.